everybody, welcome to Life Point. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to begin our service tonight. Here we go. Ooh. Mm-hmm. 
Jesus. One more time. Come thou found, come thou king. Come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou found of our blessing. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Sing it out. And now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our, our prayers and our, our songs of worship and acclamation to your throne. Lord, we acknowledge that you are our fountain of every blessing. You are the greatest blessing that we could ever receive, that our hearts could ever hope for. And I humbly ask, Lord, that you would teach our hearts to be completely, well, first of all, that you would remind our hearts that we can only be completely satisfied, made whole in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I, I pray this this morning and I continue to pray it today and tonight in our service that our, our knowledge of the love of Christ, that our awareness of how great your love is, how deep and how wide the love of Christ is, would grow in our hearts, would grow in our minds in a way that produces a life that brings glory to your name. And Lord, we know that you care about your name and we care about your name. It is the name that is above all names. We acknowledge that tonight and we proclaim that. And there is no other name in which we can be saved but through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Thank you, Lord, for Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood. And thank you for the resurrection. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. And we all say together, amen. You may be seated, church. Good evening, church. You know, I always give my grandmother a little bit of a hard time because when I'm talking to her, her hearing aids tend to run out of batteries. I think that's because of my long-windedness. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. That's okay. I love y'all, too. Um... But tonight, I kind of reminded of it. I was standing there praising the Lord with you and realized that my microphone was about to run out of batteries too. So that settles it. It's definitely me. Well, tonight we continue our study in the book of Psalms. And I am just totally amazed over the past several weeks, especially... Um, I don't know that I've made mention of this, but how God has continued to weave together what has gone on. And I'm going to have to just be honest. Um, I was always just a little bit skeptical when pastors say, well, this was just totally, you know, providential that everything worked together. And I'm like, you're reading into it a little bit too much. But now that I'm experiencing that, probably not reading into it a little too much. I think that what, uh, what we talked about this morning couples perfectly with the psalm that we will be in tonight this morning of course talking about having gratitude being in Christ for the inheritance the deliverance and the transference we have as believers and tonight the psalm that we approach could be titled the song of gratitude uh, it's all about what we are grateful for in light of who God is Spurgeon called this psalm the pearl of the psalms McLaren said, Scottish pastor, said it has dried many tears and supplied the mold into which many hearts have poured their peaceful faith. 
James Montgomery Boyce noted that ministers have used it to comfort people who are going through severe trials, suffering, illness, dying. And for some, the words of this psalm have been the very last that they have uttered in this life. A historian noted of this psalm that it has sung courage to the army of those who are disappointed. It has poured balm and consolation into the hearts of the sick, of captives in dungeons, of widows in their pinching grief, of orphans in their loneliness. Dying soldiers have died easier as it was read to them. Ghastly hospitals have been illuminated. It has visited the prisoner and broken his chains. And like Peter, Peter's angel has led him forth in imagination and sung him back home again. It has made the dying Christian slave freer than his own master. And of course, the psalm that I'm referring to is the most beloved part of the Old Testament, probably the most memorized of all of the Old Testament, the shepherd psalm, Psalm 23. Before I read the text tonight, I would just like to commend to you. In fact, Sarah, if you would, could you come here real quick? Briefly. We won't leave the kids unattended for long, I promise, folks. Um, but there is a book that uh, was, is absolutely helpful continually to me. Uh, it's W. Philip Keller's A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. Absolutely excellent. If you could put that on those back tables. I should have done that when we were coming in. Um, Philip Keller was a um, he was a sheep farmer. He was into photography, anything outdoors he has done. And he's written uh, many other books. Uh, uh, Gardner looks at the fruit of the spirit. Anyway, the shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm is a unique perspective of all of what someone who has a very firsthand appreciation for Psalm 23 has to say. So I would commend it to you. There are two copies back there that you are welcome to, if you will just read it. All right, Psalm 23, if you would, in your Bibles. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1, and I think the words will almost just flow into our memory tonight. We've heard this so often. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you tonight most grateful. Grateful for who you are and who you have revealed yourself to be in this very text. Lord, we know that the words that David wrote here are not penned lightly. They are not trite and trivial but they are a deep understanding of a walk lived before you, of fellowship with you. And Lord, I just pray that as we dive into this text tonight, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. There is no way that I can climb the mountain of explaining this text in an hour. So I pray that you would give glimpses to each one who hears it and is walking through it tonight that maybe I don't even say. I pray that we would see you clearer and that we would be drawn closer to you through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to remind you that as we look at this psalm, David was a shepherd when he was young. He spent time tending to the sheep of his father, and so he is drawing on his life experience, on what is natural, what he understood temporarily to illustrate what is Eternal, who is eternal, to explain who God was. And I've thought several times, man, what would this psalm have looked like if David, you know, was in our day and age, in our culture, and wasn't a shepherd, but maybe was a teacher 
or a businessman or just the 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 differences the reason that I mentioned this is the differences in the depth you know a, a nurse whatever it is that that there are inherently in our image bearing uh, being a follower of Christ there are inherent things in our vocational responsibilities that bear out who God really is that he is our teacher that he is the great physician and the, and the list goes on and on but here David is drawing us in and he's pointing us to, to, to what he would have understood God to be in light of all of those nights that he had spent with his own flock of sheep and so the first thing that we see in verses 1 through 4 is that David sees God as the good shepherd in verse 1 we see the, the relationship that, that David has with God pictured he sees God as my loving shepherd. Look again at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. We see that David wouldn't settle for mere religion. He wasn't about just a, this is a big ethereal God out there somewhere, but I'm not connected. No, this was David's personal God. He had a personal connection, a personal walk. He had really experienced God's loving, sovereign hand in his life. What's so interesting is that in Israel, and those of us who have been long in the scriptures understand that in Israel, the shepherd's work was the most trivial and meaningless task in that time frame. It was kind of the job that everybody else would, that was high browed would have kind of looked at and said, that's a joke. And it's, it's meaningless. It's pointless. There, there's nothing of merit in that task. And before I even move on, what struck me about that is, isn't it just like God to take what is meaningless and trivial and trite about our world and what we wouldn't understand and say, that's how I'm going to communicate who I am. That's how I'm going to display my goodness to people is through what is low and what is base. See, the shepherds would have had to spend all of their time isolated with the sheep. They would have shown an unwavering devotion to the sheep. They were solely responsible for the care of the needs of the, the sheep. They, they were the protector, the provider. Without the shepherd, the sheep would be no more. So, again, the insanity is not necessarily in this job in particular, but what's astonishing is that God has chosen, out of all occupations, repeatedly in the Scriptures, to refer to himself as the good shepherd, relating that he tends to and loves his flock in this way. I think one of the most encouraging parts of all of the scripture to me personally is when Christ is telling Peter repeatedly, if you love me, feed my sheep. Give my sheep my word. Don't be arrogant and conceited in your own way of thinking, but simply explain what I have said to my sheep in the word of God. And I think we've gotten so... We've gotten so full of ourselves in our modern age that we think, you know, that really was for a day gone by. But the Word of God is kind of, I don't know that it's really, it's not really good enough for everything the church faces today. Dave Antle said bull. And we're talking about sheep tonight. But I agree, that's bull. But what I think that you have to see here, when, when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, is that David is not only declaring something about who God is, David is also declaring something about who David is. David is saying, I'm a sheep. I'm stubborn. I wander. I, at times, am spiritually diseased. I am vulnerable. I am everything that... that I, we were driving back from... Uh, where'd we come back from? Austin. It was, sorry, it was way early in the morning when we flew back. Austin. We're driving back and there was a whole field full of sheep and they are some of the nastiest, stinkiest, stubbornest, dumb animals. I'm not, don't take this personal. Uh, that there are. And yet what God is so lovingly 
declaring here and what David is saying is look without you Lord we are nothing we need the good shepherd we we depend on you every moment of every day and so the relationship between humanity and between God is so clear here David is not only saying things about who God is but David is admitting things about who he is so we see the relationship between God and David but we also see what David enjoyed in that relationship in verses 1 through 4 the Lord is my shepherd David says and then he follows it with I shall not want he says I, sh- I will lack nothing in light of who God is God is my provider and me, my protector and I will lack nothing Again, left to themselves, sheep lack everything. Take the shepherd, the farmer, out of the picture and give it about a week and probably half of the herd would be dead. And a little bit longer and they would all fall off into oblivion. Knowing that Christ is our good shepherd, we can can be satisfied knowing that he has given us everything that we need, that we lack nothing In Christ, we lack nothing in His Word. And and, in church, I believe this. I believe that that is the single crux of, of every issue that the church faces today. In some form or fashion, the question always has to be, in the difficulties that we face in a broken generation, the question is is Christ enough? Do we say, I shall not want, or do we really mean it? Do we, do we really believe that in Christ we have everything spiritually that we could ever hope or think for or ask for? We sing constantly, Christ is enough. But I don't know, just being honest with you tonight, how many ways do we live in which we say with our very lives, you know what, Christ really isn't enough. I need a bigger job. I need a better paycheck. I need more obedient children. I need better church members. I need, and whatever it is, I need need better students. I need, and you fill in the blank. I need a better husband, a better wife. Then I could be the husband or the wife that, that, um, that I'm called to be. But the believer in Christ who has really experienced Christ and is learning to walk in who he is can really say with David, I shall not want. When we see him clearly for who he is and what he has done in our lives, what in the world could we ever hope or long for that he hasn't already given us? He says, I shall not lack anything. And secondly, he says, I won't lack rest. I will not lack rest. Look in verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep are some of the most fearful and easily panic-stricken animals that are around. They, They are just naturally, the slightest little thing that might scare them will cause them to stay up all night long. They will not sleep if they are scared. And what David understood as he was shepherding a flock and he came to those sheep that because an animal had passed by or the heat of the day had exasperated them, whatever the issue was, David understood because he had, he had spent nights awake with, with the little lambs that wouldn't go to sleep. And he understood that in God's loving and sovereign care, when the worst of the circumstances of David's life, whether it was sin or suffering, had come against him, David understood, I can rest easy at night, not because of anything I've done, but simply because God is watching over me. Because God leads me into the green pasture. I don't know if you've ever, some of you are probably a little bit more city than I am, maybe not some of you. But I can remember as a kid, we had dogs that, that we, would, um, we would take hunting with us. And those things, when it got hot and humid in Missouri in, in, in the summertime, the dogs loved to kind of crouch down in the grass and just curl up there. And, and sheep will do the same thing. When it gets hot, when, when, when the sun is blistering, the grass is a picture of coolness, of a place to lie down and rest, a place to be 
uh, to be protected and, and to find true, genuine rest. And so we see in Christ God as we trust that he is watching over all of the events of our life, everything that we go through, we can rest secure knowing that he will protect and watch over us. You see, what, what, I, what I see when I, I have to be honest with you, I, I memorized this passage of text when I was very young and didn't have a clue what it meant. Had no idea. I just knew if I was going to a funeral, if somebody died, mark it down, it's coming out. Right? And for a long time, it, you, you get caught up in the green pasture and you focus on the imagery. Uh, the point of, of, of David pointing out the green pasture isn't anything about the pasture. It's about the shepherd that leads you in that direction. It's about the shepherd whose loving care has watch over you such that you might enjoy life. You know how many Christians seem so frustrated and angry and embittered at this world? And they want, to, they want the world around them to believe genuinely, I, I trust the God that I talk about. That doesn't mesh for me. If, if you really do trust that the Lord is good and that he loves you, then you naturally will be able to enjoy the coolness of the pasture of being able to enjoy all that he gives you in life. But then we see also here in verse 2, he leads me beside quiet waters. Again, sheep, stupid, scared animals. Even when they had laid down in the cool of the day, because the shepherd was watching over them, then they would come to the point where they were thirsty and they needed cool water. And anybody that's ever shepherded sheep understands that when the sheep would come to the side of the brook, if the water was moving too quickly, the sheep would just walk away. Even though they were thirsting to death, that was just too scary. And so what the good shepherd would always do would take boulders and line them up along the stream embankment to slow the water down so that the sheep could come and partake of the cool, refreshing waters. So what do we see? Uh, I think, and it might be a stretch, but I think that what, what David is pointing to is God lovingly dams up his word in our lives sometimes. There are things that we go through where we need to just hang on one passage of text and drink the coolness of his water. There have been times in the middle of the night I've gone through things and I've been woken up by, by whatever struggle it may be and one particular passage in psalms or i can remember for the first several years of my walk with christ hanging on my, my email address my personal one i don't know i'm giving this out only his grace 28 at gmail.com that only his grace is ephesians 2 8 and i can remember waking up so many nights and hanging my hat on god how are you going to work this out how are you going to work that out not being able to be the sheep that could enjoy the cool the cool pastor but the goodness of his water as he brought it of his word into my life Ephesians 2 8 for by grace are you saved Jay and that through faith not of yourself right it's a gift our salvation is a gift of grace not of works and I can remember just hanging on to that so the question is are there texts are there passages as life gets difficult that you seem to run to I hope that there are Friends, I can tell you that there were years in my life where I would, I would inevitably, difficulty would come and I would go to my closest lost friend and ask them for their worldly advice to bring me comfort. That comfort is always fleeting and never refreshing. But the cool water of God's word will always satisfy those who call on the name of the Lord. And so we lack nothing. David also says in verse 3, I will not, I, I will not, excuse me, 3b, I will not lack guidance. He says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Cheap, again, stubborn, obnoxious, hard-headed, tend to go their own way, to go astray, to wander, to do as they please. And David is picturing himself. David is probably, if, 
he's looking at his own rebellion towards God and saying, I am that sheep that continually goes astray. That the, the hymn writer would say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. We tend to walk away from the Lord. And, and if you would listen to a lot of Christians, you would think, so when the sheep wanders away, God just kind of says, see ya, get out of here. I mean, because real sheep who really love Jesus would never stray. Wrong. All over Scripture, we see people who genuinely love the Lord, but really had battles in their flesh to fight through. That really had to come to a place of understanding God's grace that was deeper than just, I will never sin in this lifetime. But yet, when I do sin, God will not let me continually, and this is a problem that I see so much today there's there's a balance here we can't be the kind of Christians who say well people will never sin if they're really in Christ that's absolutely categorically ludicrous but we also shouldn't be the church that says you know what sin's not really a big deal I mean just let people live however they want to that's really none of your business your business Jay is to give them the gospel to preach the word to them in, 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 in kind of a vague way bring them to the point of salvation and then just wash your hands of everything going on in their lives their sin is between them and God and, and this church doesn't have it shouldn't have any concern in the matter and that's not true either the shepherd here rightly pictured, as David is pointing, is, is a shepherd that when the sheep goes astray, lovingly draws that sheep back in. Goes out and finds that one lost sheep and brings them back to the fold. Does everything that he can to make sure that not one sheep is lost. So the good shepherd guides the sheep. And then verse 4, David says, I will not lack safety, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I can remember being very perplexed when this was read at funerals. What are they talking about? The valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David is remembering here is that as he would have led his sheepfold, his flock, from one pasture to the next, he would have come up against some really tight cliffs where the sheep would have had to kind of walk in a straight line. And there was always the, the, the fear that one of those sheep, if they went astray at the wrong moment, would fall off and possibly die. Because th th this particular area where he was walking through, the valley of the shadow of death would have been hidden from the sun. Th th there would have been boulders and, and, and the, the, the peak of the mountains through the valley that would have hidden the sun from where David was leading the sheep. And what David says here is that even in the midst of those valleys, even in the darkest parts where sheep would tend to go astray and get lost and get injured and in my own life in the darkest valleys where I've been hurt the most and I've struggled the most and I ran from you God the most even in those valleys and don't miss part of what is being alluded to here even when the sun is obscured by the difficulty of the valley you're still with me even when I'm in the darkest, friends, here's the thing. When, when our brothers and sisters in Christ are at their darkest moments and they're struggling and they ask questions like, where is God in this? I don't understand why he would allow this or, or, or maybe it's their own sin. I, I don't know. I'm so stupid. I don't know why I did this. To sin against God in this way. I love him and I can't believe that I would walk away from him for whatever the reason is. I, I believe part of our image-bearing responsibility, our ministry to people in those kinds of situations is to remind them, even in the darkness of their valley, God still walks with you. Even though the Son of God is, obs is obscured and you're having a hard time seeing His interaction in your life at this particular moment, He still sees you. 
You see, we tend to struggle with, I can't see God in this, when we really just need to be encouraged, but he sees you in the midst of it, so don't worry about it. He sees you in the midst of the most difficult, trying circumstance. And, and, and David points in at the rod and the staff. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As I'm going through those difficult, dark valleys, as as I have enemies that come against me, as I sin egregiously, whatever the case may be, those dark valleys of life, there are two things, God, that you possess that are an encouragement to me. And the first one was your rod generally would have been a club made of oak about two foot long. It would would have been used to beat off predators, to potentially chase in the sheep, although I've heard this text preached sometimes as though the only thing that God ever does is chase in the sheep. I believe that God does chase in us, but I believe that God's preeminent concern in communicating the rod here is not chastisement, but protection. That God is protecting us. And in that, we have to understand a mature understanding in Christ of godly chastisement or discipline is that when God disciplines us, it is very much protection He is working out in our lives. When God chastens us and draws us away from the world and back to Himself, He's not doing that like an angry, tyrannical father who's just, who just wants to whip his kids because they're annoying him. He's a loving shepherd who is simply drawing the sheep back to himself so they don't get hurt. So David is encouraged by the rod. He's also encouraged by the staff. The staff would have been this long, and you've seen it, long hook-like deal, instrument, very long, that would have been used to wrap around the the, um, sheep's head and possibly pull them from danger, from holes and from being caught in thickets. It would have been used to hold brush back so that as 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 uh, I love that ringtone. Um, never mind. Holding a brush and the dangers back, it would have been used. This one's my favorite. I love this. When I understand in this day and time, they would have used the staff because you don't want to get close to it to annihilate the snakes that they would find along the way. If you've got a two-foot club and a six-foot staff, I guarantee you I know which one I'm using to kill the snake. It's not the two-foot, no. What David is so much trying to press into us again is no matter what happens in this life, whatever it is, well, Jay, what about this? Whatever it is, whatever is in the darkest point of your darkest valley, God is still there offering protection to you. He is there in the midst of it, working things that are unseen that you or I don't know about, but he is working all things together for his glory and for your good. Of course, this particular text, even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, is certainly very applicable when we come to a funeral, when we come to the very reality of death and when we're grieving over the loss of a loved one. The psalm has deep implications. And it's, 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 it's fitting. And, it, and, and there's a reason why we constantly hear it at funerals. But even in those moments where we lose people that we love so much... God is still with us. God never leaves us or forsakes us. Donald uh, Gray Barnhouse, he was the, I believe, the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I think. He lost his wife when his children were young. And on the heels of hearing this particular psalm read at her funeral, he was walking away with his children. And we're talking a great expositor of God's word. He was able to illustrate like nobody else. But he was grieving. He was struggling. He was in the midst of the darkest valley of his life, having to say goodbye to the love of his life and then go on to raise their children together. And as he's walking away, he's trying with all of his might to conjure up some way to bring his children comfort, to encourage them in the loss of their mother, 
that God really is still with them, and he, and he just couldn't. He, there was nothing he could, he could come up with. And just before they crossed the street, a bus passed in front of them, blocking out the sun, and there was a shadow of the bus that cast itself against every one of the family members. And the light went on. And he looked to all of his children, and he said, let me ask you a question. If I gave you two options, and, and one was you get to get hit by a bus, and the other is you get to get hit by the shadow of the bus, which one would you take? Well, that's a hard one. All of his kids said, probably thinking, boy, Dad's grieving in a very unique way. We need to get him home so he can rest. All of his kids looked and said, well, Dad, of course we would want to be hit with this shadow not with the actual bus. And he turned and he looked, to, looked at every one of them and he said, and that is exactly what happened to Christ 2,000 years ago on the cross. The bus of death ran over him. And only the shadow touched your mother. And she is at home with him at this very moment. I think about that shadow of death that has passed over people that I love. Mommity, Poppity, Nanny, Poppy, all of, all of these wonderful people in my young adult life that poured into me who are no longer here. And I rejoice in the fact that it was only a shadow. That because they were in Christ, they did not truly die, but they were only ushered into his presence. And there are so many of us who have lost loved ones. I hope that is certainly a comfort to you as well. And so we see the good shepherd. Then we see in this psalm, David kind of shifts gears here in verses 5 and 6, and he's kind of done with the analogy of, of the Lord being the good shepherd, and he moves in the direction of, of illustrating God to be a gracious host. He says in verses 5 and 6, "'You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies.'" You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, as we saw in verse 1, David starts just by giving a picture of what his relationship with God was like by illustrating that the Lord is a shepherd. And here, in like manner, David points and says, Now the Lord is also a gracious host. He's also one who is hospitable and loves me, who receives me, even in the most difficult. And I think that you, you can't miss that David has just been talking about the darkest valleys of his life, the, 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 the shadow of death that passes over. And then he says, even in the midst of all of that, God is a, is a great host that welcomes me in. Christ was was exiled so that I would never be refused entrance before God. That's, that's what David is pointing at here. He's, he's, he's trying to drive home at the, at, at the fact that even in his difficult circumstance, God was lavishing on him like a adoring host. And again, just like David identified himself as a sheep, here he identifies himself as a lowly sojourner, someone who is just passing through and who is exhausted and tired and worn and who has the potential for his enemies to devour him and conquer him. And yet in the very presence of those people, David says that God prepares a table like a gracious host. And he says again, I will lack nothing as I enjoy this relationship with God in being a loving host. I will lack no provision. God anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. I don't know if you've ever been. I had a grandmother like this. Probably part of the reason why I'm not a tiny guy anymore. Every time I would go over to her house, you couldn't have a spot on your plate that lacked anything. It was nonstop. Like you would eat your mashed potatoes. Baby, do you need more of those? No, I'm going to, you, you want to say I'm a puke. <laughs> You're going, I can remember going out as, as, a, as a teenager to get in my truck, and she's like chasing me down with food. Here, take this, take that. I'm like, 
I'm going on the interstate. There's a McDonald's. I'm not going to (laughs) die. She was a generous host, though, constantly wanting to make sure that we were full of whatever it is she had to offer. And friends, we can't miss the fact that we have a God who has lavished on us all things and withheld absolutely nothing, who is very generous in all that he has lacks nothing and some of you might say well jay i don't know that i really believe that that i lack nothing in the midst of my most difficult circumstances because it certainly feels like a lot of loss and a lot of lacking when i've lost people the people that i've talked to you guys about so often you guys probably get tired of hearing about them but my grandparents who meant so much to me when i lost them it certainly didn't feel like i lacked nothing felt like the whole world was torn, torn apart. But the fact is, is that what David is pressing in on is that God will let us experience loss and the lack of all things in this life such that we would gain Him. He gives us everything that we need, not everything that we want. Sarah, forgive me in advance. And I've probably explained this because it happens all the time, but... When we go on a trip, Sarah needs to take a lot of things with her. Oh boy, that was Jorge, not me. (laughs) So she packs the suitcase and stands on it and zips it. And I'm like, alrighty. Back surgery is not going to be a problem later in life. I appreciate everything that I'm sure if anything happens to the plane, as long as that suitcase lands on the same island we are, we're going to be good. And that's the way that some of us in life look to God for the things that we quote-unquote need. That we pack everything full. That, God, these are all the things that I really need. And, and every time that my beautiful, adoring bride packs her suitcase, I've never said this before, and I'm saying it where there's a lot of witnesses. I've always thought in the back of my head when she says, well, I need that. I always think, I wonder if this house caught on fire and you had to pack what you really needed if the suitcase would really be that big. Because there is definitely a difference between want and need. And in our lives, I think we need to come to an understanding and a point reconciling God really has given us everything that we need in Christ. If we receive not one more earthly blessing in this life, If food, water, everything that we quote-unquote even need physically were withheld from us, eternally we have absolutely everything we will ever need, period, in Christ. We have what we need. We lack nothing. And then David kind of finishes out. He, he says, I will never lack goodness. Right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then he, 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 he kind of pushes and, and, and looks in the direction of eternity and says, I won't even, I won't lack eternal blessing because I will dwell in the house of the living God forever. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he has provided in Christ, I will dwell forever. Harry Ironside said, it, it gave this illustration, and I, I, as I use it, I, I kind of hesitated to even use it because it kind of points in the direction of mental illness, and I certainly don't make light of anyone who has a loved one who struggles with mental illness, but I think you'll get the point regardless. Harry Ironside, pastor of a large church in Chicago, had a a young woman who constantly would come to him and telling him, there are two men who who are following me to church. As soon as I leave my apartment and I lock the door, they're standing there. And when I get on the trolley, they're right beside me. And and when I come to the church, they follow me in. And he watched this for months and months and months. And finally, one day, the light bulb came on. And he's going, these two dudes are not real. How am I going to help this woman? 
And she comes again frantically. These two men are following me again. This difficulty. They're going to do something bad. And she's, she's struggling. And he finally resolved that his response was, Oh, you don't, need to be, you don't need to be concerned with them. They're just David's servants. And she said, David's, David's servants? And he said, yes. And he, he opened his Bible to Psalm 23 and verse 6, and he says, he pointed, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And he said, one of those men is name is goodness and the other one is mercy and so as they follow you around all of your life never be worried never tremble because they are only there to help you and he said that woman never returned to complain about them certainly it would, would seem logical after months that they continued she would have these delusions but she was so helped knowing that goodness and mercy we're following her everywhere. And here's the point. How much different would our Christian walk look if we really look to Christ as the good shepherd who is sufficient and the great host who has given us everything that we need and that his goodness and mercy follows us everywhere? Wouldn't our lives look markedly different? Instead, so many of us think that our failures and our brokenness follow us everywhere that we go. That our mistakes and our past are really what God sends behind us. That's not at all what David pointed to. That God's goodness and his mercy is what he lavished on David. And it's what he lavishes on each one of us who are in Christ tonight. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you humble. Humble that we know that you have graciously called us out as sheep who need a shepherd.